All right, <laughs> let's let's get started. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you you patented it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now <laughs> you're selling it. You want to sell it? Well, I I don't think you're giving us our due credit. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think they should. Cinderella story. You want answers? We're on a mission from God. Inconceivable! Take your sticking paws off me! I'm afraid I can't do that. Fresh. Have fun storming the castle! Hey everybody, welcome to Story Cauldron, finding the folktales, fables, and philosophies behind your favorite Hollywood films. I'm Bobby, the movie dude. I'm Anthony, the philosophy guy. And I'm Garrett, and I'm here. And we are all here to watch movies and talk about them. All of the stories that we love, that we now see up on the cinema screen, they're all coming from the same cultural pot that's been brewing and stewing, uh, in the words of J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, for as long as there have been people to tell stories. And, and so we throw all of our ideas into the story cauldron and ladle out new versions of those stories in every generation. So now we do that uh, through our movies, and, and that's what we are here to explore. And today we're checking out the movie that taught us all about not trusting petting zoos so much and giving us a worst-case scenario for every roller coaster that we strap into. This week we're talking about one of our favorite films of all time, Jurassic Park. God, I love this movie. <laughs> so let's start with the movie itself. So for anyone who doesn't know, Jurassic Park is... Um a movie about a couple of paleontologists, a mathematician, a lawyer, an old dude who meddles in gene splicing, and his two grandkids, which one proves more useful than the other. They go all go to an island theme park based around the resurrection of extinct dinosaurs for a free preview. What's the worst that could happen, right? <laughs> well, a killer storm comes through and the power fails, letting all these nasty critters out and giving them the opportunity to try their hand at people hunting. Sounds about right, doesn't it? That sounds pretty good yeah this is one of my favorite movies of all time uh when did you guys first watch the movie oh i was in third grade maybe fourth grade i was when i was a kid uh, i i can't tell you how many times i've seen this movie this is probably the movie that i have seen more than any other single film ever i mean we're talking in the dozens of of watches for me um, i'm right there with you i remember going and seeing it while I was at the, uh, or staying with my grandparents, actually, we went and watched it at the Century Cinema Five, <laughs> um, the local movie theater, and uh, I, I loved it. And it scared the the pants off of you. Oh yeah, I had I had one of those old dinosaur encyclopedias. Uh huh. You know, I had all the pictures and stuff, and I was like, I was ready for it, and then I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, yeah, I, I watched it. Uh, dozens of times after that as well because my grandparents had surround sound and oh, yes the best thing on that surround sound was that opening scene with the boom you know <laughs> that really low rumble that just shook the house so it's uh it, this is this is one of those movies that i would just have on in the background just constantly uh, i mean i i probably have the script for this movie in my subconscious just because <laughs> i would have it playing um, constantly. It would, it would end and we would just start it over from the beginning again because it's just so much fun. So what about you, Garrett? Uh, well, I remember seeing bits and pieces of it from when I was little at Grandma and Grandpa's house uh, as well. Um, and I always remember Grandma stopping and going, Garrett, don't watch this. You're not old enough yet. And <laughs> so I always watched little bits and pieces and I never really got to see the beginning until yesterday when I in prep for this podcast, I actually sat down and watched the film in its entirety. <laughs> beginning to end. Beginning mm -hmm. to end instead Lovely. of just little bits and pieces and here and there. So. so does the hype live up to the movie? Movie live up to the hype, I guess. Yeah. That, yes. That's the right way to say it. <laughs> it, it really does. It, I didn't think I would like it very much as a full movie, but I <laughs> was sitting up last night when I normally would be sleeping and just going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, <laughs> who's going to get eaten next? <laughs> yeah, I'm, see, I'm glad that that you had not seen it before because I'm, I was afraid that Bobby and I would have 
nostalgia glasses on with this one and th- that it would be harder for us to criticize it or, or to, to critique it. Yeah. Um, but, but well, I mean, we are consummate professionals, so we'll do our best. But it's good to have a more objective viewpoint here. Well, dude, I always remember. <laughs> I always remember seeing these little bits and pieces, and I remember that Samuel L. Jackson's in it. I just I, the thing that I always forget is that the phrase "Hold on to your butts" <laughs> is from that film, which yes. I say daily. You do say it daily, <laughs> and then I've started to say it too. So uh, I always forget that that little tidbit is in there, and whenever he says it, I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> that. And, Clever girl. Clever girl. That's right. Oh. That was actually one part that I hadn't seen until I watched it in its entirety last night. Yeah. So. Oh, such a good movie. Well, this this is a, a first for us on the Story Cauldron because this is this movie is a uh, direct adaptation of some uh, pre-existing story. It was a book first. Michael Crichton. Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park. Have either of you read the book? I have. Um, but nope. Uh, I don't read. Maybe a long time ago. Not long after I first watched the movie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, and, and the the history between the book and the movie is very closely tied together. Michael Crichton had already written a couple of uh, a couple of books that were rather popular at the time, like the Andromeda Strain, that, that mm. had been turned into a movie. Yeah. And. To make a long story short, the the movie rights for Jurassic Park were actually purchased even before he had finished writing the book. And, and so it was always kind of intentionally somewhere in the back of his head that there was going to be a movie made of this. And, and he had been working on the story for a, for a long time, even before he became the big name that he is. Uh, so it wasn't just that he, it's not like he just wrote it to yeah. make the movie. But after the movie did so amazingly well, I mean, it was a blockbuster right from the get go. Were you saying something about it's uh, like a billion dollar? Ra- yeah, it yeah. is. A, it is a billion dollar movie. It has made over the course of its history since 1993 over a billion with a B. It was Universal's first billion dollar movie, actually, and they have a couple of others now with like the Furious franchise and things, but yeah, <laughs> minions, ugh. but, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, this was the first. Says the guy with Universal. three daughters. <laughs> Why do you think I'm saying that? <laughs> but uh, the, the movie did so well that people wanted Crichton to write a sequel to the book so that they could turn the sequel to the book into another movie, and that's where The Lost World <laughs> came from, and it's yeah, the, the the sequels, um, th- those ones were okay, kind of. They got progressively yeah. worse and, and never really were as popular until you get to Jurassic World, which came out just a few years ago, which really has revitalized the franchise. It has also already made uh, over a billion dollars. Which is actually where I found out about Anthony's love of Jurassic Park because we, uh, oh we went to the movie together and we're like... <gasps> Did I cry? I might have cried. We, I, I felt I like a little kid again. You're sitting in the theater and you've got these gigantic Tyrannosaurus Rexes. Rex, well, you've got these gigantic dinosaurs, there you T-Rex go. and, uh, and the Indominus Rex, and they're fighting and you're just... Uh, I felt like I was eight years old. <laughs> Not a dry eye in the entire place. <laughs> yeah, no, dry eyes. I don't know. But, but this, um, this story in the movie is it's very similar to the book but it's not identical there they, they made a few changes like you know always happens which is interesting because Crichton actually worked on the screenplay as well yeah but uh they they made a few things more friendly John Hammond you know the actual scientist is much more likable in the movie in the book he is more of kind of a mad scientist who spoiler alert he actually dies in the book uh, he gets eaten by some of his dinosaurs. I need to read this book. Yeah, yeah. So if you didn't like Hammond, like I think you were saying in the green room, mm-hmm. Garrett, uh, you should you should definitely read the book. Yeah. Well, and then you know Spielberg had to put his own flavor into it because right. he said that he wanted to make Jaws on land. Mm-hmm. So I think he I think he he managed to he, pull it off. Uh, yeah. Although I'm not terrified to go to Hawaii. I, I'm still kind of scared to go into the water. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, and I guess that's one of the real achievements with this movie is that they, they take something which is so obviously not realistic in your every like you're not going to go to the grocery store and stumble across a velociraptor but hopefully but <laughs> you can still be terrified i mean when you're watching it it, it is still so realistic yeah uh, that that it is still scary this is a a wonderful 
uh, horror movie, science fiction horror movie. Yeah, no, I I love it. I mean, it's it's plausible. Mm-hmm. You've got dinosaurs. You've got gene splicing. You've got all the things that you know scientists have proven they can do. Well, with, they're working on. They're working on. Well, I mean, what well, I'm talking GMOs and stuff. Oh, like that. sure. Yeah. I mean, that stuff exists, and uh, you know, I'm just it's like only a matter of time. Well, you know, it's before the Velociraptors at the grocery life store. finds a way. <laughs> life finds a way. <laughs> life yes. finds a way. Uh, remind me of that later in the podcast. There's something I want to talk about. <laughs> so so where, where is this movie coming from? Where, I mean, uh, Crichton is writing this book intentionally. He's writing about dinosaurs. He is writing about uh, the, uh, the, the, the advance of science. And then when they make it into the movie, they, they really play up some of the corporate, uh, <laughs> the kind of evil, greedy corporations. That, yeah. Those were kind of popular mm-hmm. villains in movies in the 90s. Uh, and then you definitely see that here with the, oh, with the, the lawyer, the lawyer and the uh, merchandising and, the and just merchandising everything. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there, there is some intentional stuff there, but in, you know, when we go into the story cauldron, we're always looking for the underlying ideas and the older stories that might've been in the back of Crichton's brain and, and Spielberg's brain when they're making this stuff. So what, what are you thinking about for that? Well, uh, there's a few, actually. Uh, the first one would be probably Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Let's. This is good. Not so much on the dinosaur, but definitely with the... Definitely can, in making monsters. Making can you monsters. you totally just put in the sound clip of the... Oh, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. <laughs> That'd be it's really... Alive. Just have Hammond just being like, it's alive. Yeah. I, I love that. Uh, okay, so what about uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? How where are we seeing that here? Um, so you've got this uh, this man who's trying to bring back what once you know, was dead. Yeah, what once was dead. I uh, bring new life into it. Uh, kind of create life, which this is an extinct extinct species in Jurassic Park, and uh, he's bringing it back to life. He's playing God, <laughs> and uh, that's what I'm kind of getting here is that you know life finds a way to survive um, after it's originally born. Just because you have the ability to bring new life into this, does it mean that uh, it's going to go exactly to plan? <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, if you look at the Frankenstein story, Doctor Frankenstein was like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll teach him. Uh, you know, the ways of the world, uh, culture, all this other stuff. But he turns into being this, well, kind of a psychopathic monster, uh, you know. Isn't he all about the murdering? That's all about, yeah, maiming, murdering, mm-hmm. throwing little girls into wells. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah. I was it's... going to make a little Timmy joke, and I <laughs> stopped myself. Uh, Timmy. Well, you can once we get back to the kids in the Jurassic Park. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, exactly. it'll come up. It'll come up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in fact, uh, Anthony, you were telling me about one of your favorite lines in the uh, in the movie. Oh, yeah. Um, and it was from Ian Malcolm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the boardroom scene. It's, it's before anything bad actually happens. Uh, Ian Malcolm, who is one of my favorite fictional characters, probably, um, <laughs> he is just shaking his head at the whole thing. He's one of the experts that's been brought in to kind of look at the park and, and see if it's all up to snuff and if, it, if this is working well. And he thinks this is just a horrible idea. There is nothing about what what Hammond and his team have done with these dinosaurs that, that uh, Malcolm thinks is okay. He, he is confident from the first moment that things are going to go bad, and they do. I mean, he's he's the guy who is uh, who gets to say, I told you so, over and over for the rest of the film. But in the boardroom scene, before they actually go on the tour, he is waving his hands in the air and, and just shaking his head and saying, this is that, that, that you never stopped to actually ask yourself if this was a good idea. Your, your scientists are so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they never stop to ask if they should. Yeah, and that's, uh, I, I feel like that's the main theme that goes through Jurassic Park and through uh, Frankenstein is like, should you 
be messing with this stuff? Um, should you be bringing this stuff back to life? Um, is it gone for a reason? Is it, you know, like, are you stupid? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, this has what to be, good can come from this? This yeah. has to be one of the least surprising yeah. disaster movies you can you can imagine that yeah i mean very you, true you bring back these gigantic monsters and then they kill and eat everything i mean what did you expect yeah i mean i'm pretty sure just from the uh like the the movie poster from yeah. <laughs> from back in 93 it's like there's a dinosaur on that i bet they're gonna eat people <laughs> yeah. i mean it would almost be a disappointment if they didn't I think the only dinosaur movie where I did not think that was like Land Before Time. <laughs> Which <laughs> conveniently has no people. Yeah, in it. exactly. <laughs> well, I don't know. I got really excited when people started to get eaten by dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. Jurassic like, Park? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That toilet scene? Yeah. <laughs> How is that not hilarious? I was so happy. Because <laughs> that, that guy, I don't know the actor's name who I, played I, uh, the, lawyer, the lawyer, Gennaro. Uh, he was so good at being... So awful. (laughs) He's just smarmy. Yeah, and you're you're so happy to watch him die. (laughs) And like, you know, running into the bathroom, hiding in the stall. (laughs) And and then, you know, just like, kung, kung, kung. Ah. He just just has this look of disbelief. (laughs) Never thought I'd go out like this, (laughs) sitting on a toilet, (laughs) Uh being eaten Eaten by a dinosaur. (laughs) Yeah, it's It's a lot, but it's so good. Uh, oh, I have a I have a theory about the lawyer. You, sure, you want to hear my theory? But yes, 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 I do. His name is uh, is Gennaro, right? Uh, do you remember in the movie Die Hard what John McClane's wife's oh, maiden name was? Gennaro. Yeah, yeah. I and that's uh, I, I have this this theory that the lawyer is like her her horrible uncle, <laughs> mainly because I want to see John McClane fight dinosaurs. That, that's the bottom line oh, of this theory. Oh, I just want to see oh. that crossover. If you haven't I mean, picked wow. it up yet, Die Hard we are big Jurassic Die Hard Park. fans also. <laughs> yeah, there's the, there's the Die Hard reference for this For, for this, this episode. episode. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, so with Frankenstein, the, you know, the, 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 the message is very clearly focused on humanity i mean with jurassic park you don't get that as much because it's it's not it, you're not bringing humans back to life you're bringing these ancient animals these ancient monsters but but you uh you get to see the pride the hubris is the fun word Ooh, of, good. of man good word with uh <laughs> thinking that this is a good idea i mean oh yeah we'll be fine we're very advanced we're very uh smart and we've spared no expense, it's, <laughs> which is arguably not true. But well, yeah, it's definitely not true because that was lime jello. I'm pretty <laughs> sure there was something else that they could have eaten. <laughs> For sure, <laughs> was the prime rib. <laughs> so the uh, the that, that but that theme that theme of hubris is definitely something you see in in Shelley's book, uh, in Frankenstein, and and it's what. Hammond is absolutely plagued with. I mean, that, that's what Malcolm is constantly trying to wake him up to and saying, look, you, you, yes, you, you have this ability, but, but maybe you should restrain yourself. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you should show some, uh, some self-control. Maybe and, bring back the dodo first yeah. and see how that goes. <laughs> or at least bring back something that can't eat you in one gulp. Yeah. I, <laughs> But oh, even then, man. I still think Malcolm would have a problem with bringing back the dodo. I think he would still say, you don't know what could happen with what this. What could happen? Right. What implications could arise from introducing that into an ecosystem, maybe? And there's a lot. I mean, that's kind of a common trope in science fiction as a whole. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea that some technological development spirals out of control. Whether it's like the Matrix we, we talked about in our last episode with the, with the machines there. Or something like... Uh, like the virus that the new Planet of the Apes franchise has been focused around, the simian mm, flu yeah. that was supposed to cure Alzheimer's and ends up creating super smart monkeys and killing most of the humans on the planet. I mean, like, you know, they they had this idea, but it yeah. spiraled out of control. Uh, and and <laughs> you're definitely seeing that with Jurassic Park here. Well, I mean, you even see that. You see that in a lot of, uh, like, end of days uh post-apocalyptic type movies mm-hmm. um think of like i am legend or omega man you know yeah that's uh that's exactly what happened you know it's uh, supposed to be uh 
what's what's the word that I'm thinking of? Vaccine. There we go. Oh, yeah. That uh, is um, supposed to help people, and it ends up killing everybody mm-hmm. and uh, creating these monsters. And uh, it's it's a really common theme throughout. Well, horror, I guess, and uh, horror and sci-fi. And I think the thing that I love about Jurassic Park in this respect is that the motivation for this technological advancement <laughs> is so unbelievably cheap. It's not, they're not trying to save uh, the planet. They're not trying to cure cancer. They're not trying to heal anything. They're trying to sell lunch boxes. <laughs> yeah. That's what Malcolm's whole point is. You're trying to just make a bunch of money and slap a, uh, you know, slap it on a lunchbox and sell it, and 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 that's yeah. what spirals out of control. <laughs> that and the uh, it was like, oh yes, it was like you are perfectly safe. Uh, we have a jeep <laughs> 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 and and uh, electric fences. That it's a tropical island. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, you don't have a power plant on <laughs> on island. Yeah. You're running mostly on you know like uh, the generators and stuff like that and. The, but it's like, yeah, there's no way that this could be a bad idea mm-hmm. at all. Well, of course it's on an island. They won't. They wouldn't have anywhere to go. Yeah, That's, I know. Yeah, the, the, I just can't ima- or can't get over the fact that oh yeah, this is all for entertainment. It's mm-hmm. all for uh, commerce. It's all for yeah, yeah, just yeah. Stupid at least with reasons. Frankenstein, he was trying to create something for. Well, I don't know. You maybe you can remind me what what Dr. Frankenstein's motivation was. Was he just doing it to see if he could do it for the advancement of science? Partially, yeah. I mean, and there's always people that I've talked about. Uh, he's doing it as kind of like a preventative measure just to, like, we can live forever oh, once we to figure out death. Ah, defeating yes. death. Yeah, Which all goes back to humans wanting to be God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, right. Hubris. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's very similar, but I feel like, yeah. It, it is a little bit of a nobler cause in Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, uh, so. but in Jurassic Park. And they uh, they don't play it up so much in the sequels, but it does really come into play in Jurassic World, the commercialization of the dinosaurs. Yeah. I mean, you actually, by the time you get to Jurassic World, you see the functioning park like it's it's working and at the same time there are these guys that want to try and use the dinosaurs as military weapons so, yeah i mean th- it is we're gonna weaponize the loss of raptors yeah because oh, again dear. what could go wrong with that i want <laughs> sharks with freaking laser beams attached <laughs> to their heads oh dear oh dear <laughs> i think uh, i think that this is uh i've actually seen jurassic park used as part of an argument for liberal arts education <laughs> <laughs> with, with all of the emphasis on STEM, on, on science, technology, uh, engineering, and In, mathematics mm, training, yeah. which, you know, those are where a lot of the, um, a lot of industries are trending. Sometimes liberal arts kind of gets left in left in the wake there's not as much time there's not as much funding for things like literature for things like philosophy and art <laughs> not enough time to stop and think about hmm maybe this isn't such a good idea yeah they, they, <laughs> you you need these stories of of uh, of hubris of of the da- downfalls of of people's pride to kind of teach us what we can, what we should do with our capabilities yeah and i mean that's that's one of the oldest functions of telling a story uh, there is. I mean, it's, it's a warning. Moral education. Yeah. Moral, moral education. Uh, teaching right from wrong. Whether, you know, some actions have consequences. Um, like, all of that stuff is plays into, you know, the telling of a story uh, in an oral tradition just to keep people safe. Yeah, and it's like learning from history. Yeah. Learning from those that came before you. Learn from their mistakes. Don't make the same mistakes. And learn from these fictional characters who are in situations that you might not actually find yourself, but you can still draw lessons from their examples. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the the very first I'll put a shameless plug here. The very first thing that I ever had uh, had published was a chapter in a book on Jurassic Park and philosophy. Where awesome. Where a friend of mine from grad <laughs> school and I we wrote a chapter on Ian Malcolm and John Hammond, comparing Malcolm and his virtues as opposed to Hammond and his vices. Uh, so we, we, we said that Mal- Malcolm demonstrated these good, positive character traits, things like temperance, uh, whereas um, Hammond is this, this character marked by pride. 
Yeah. So basically, you should be like Malcolm in all of his shirtless glory. <laughs> I gotcha. Well, um, yeah. Uh, shirtless glory was that the that sh- the part it, that I just kind of like threw me. Uh, <laughs> I know you get that image of him laid back. I I don't know bloody leg. <laughs> if you ever saw the fly, you would never uh, think Jeff Goldblum would be a, like a sex symbol. <laughs> <laughs> there he is, laying out there. Oh man, Gosh, yeah, we he was from, brutal in that. Ugh. We went from liberal arts and STEM education straight to shirtless glory and <laughs> sex symbols. <laughs> hey, I don't, I don't know how, how our brains work. <laughs> yeah, but train but, of thought. <laughs> uh, but okay, so I said myths earlier. I mean, there are plenty of myths that we can point to uh, where the lesson is: be careful of your pride. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. There are, uh, in, I mean, in Greek mythology, that, that was a huge concern for the Greeks. Hubris was one of the uh, ultimate wrongs that you can do. There, there are lots of stories of the gods in Greek mythology coming down and punishing the king or, or even just some peasant girl for being really good. I mean, it, and, and sometimes it almost seems unfair yeah. because sometimes the Greek gods and goddesses are... Almost, they almost seem kind of like vicious characters in themselves. <laughs> They're jealous of, yeah, yeah. Of, of someone's skill or of someone's beauty, and, and so they come down and punish them for being objectively good at something. But uh, the probably the classic story of, of, of hubris in Greek mythology is the story of Icarus. Yeah. Icarus and Daedalus uh, f- flying too close to the sun. Well, Icarus does. I- Icarus falls yeah. too close to the sun. Yeah, de- de- or falls too close to Wow. <laughs> Flies too close Flies. to the sun and then falls. And then, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Daedalus was this. Uh, well, do you, do you I know the story. Yeah. You know the story. Okay. Um, woof, woof. Well, I think I know the story. Um, <laughs> but I always thought it was pronounced Daedalus. It could be. I, 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 de- I don't know. Daedalus. That's Daedalus. What I was taught in like elementary school when we learned the story. Um mm-hmm. No, I've heard it both ways. Yeah, same. It wasn't Daedalus. He was like this amazing architect, I want to say. And he... Architect, inventor, all around jack of all trades. Yeah. He, he built the... He built the labyrinth. He built the labyrinth. Yeah, he built the labyrinth. Theseus and the Minotaur in the labyrinth. Wasn't yep. he eventually put... He Wasn't he put in the labyrinth? Yeah. Yes. He was... Uh, with his son, Icarus, who mm-hmm. helped him with the labyrinth, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And um, they get trapped in there because they're the only... Well they know all the secrets to it because they created it. And so in their escape, they have candle wax and bird feathers that they basically stockpile. And he puts all of these bird feathers together to make two sets of wings, one for himself and one for his son Icarus, uh, with the feathers and the candle wax so that they'll stick Mm -hmm. together. And that way they can fly out of the labyrinth. But the trick is you can't fly too close to the sun because it will melt the wax. And, you and will then fall your wings to will fall apart and you will fall and die. Death. Yeah. Well, Daedalus goes out with his wings and he makes and he starts going and then Icarus does the same, but he is like, Oh, look at me, I can fly. This is awesome. And then he gets too close to the sun, his wings melt, and boom, he's gone. Well, of course flat. Daedalus uh flat. <laughs> Daedalus is uh he he makes the wings and he's constantly warning his son Icarus, yeah, don't fly too close to the sun. You just it'll end badly, no matter what. Just don't do it, mm-hmm. you know. And of course, uh, somehow, Daedalus falls asleep while flying over the ocean, and Icarus is like, "Well, I guess I could try it," you know. <laughs> and uh, it just, yeah, ends badly. And then, of course, you know, Daedalus wakes up, and there's no Icarus. Icarus is gone. That's In funny. fact, I, I think there was a few like famous paintings that illustrate that oh, the in the background Icarus? yeah oh, interesting. and uh like fall of icarus is the, the main one right. but there's a couple other ones oh, where we'll find out like, we'll oh. put a link to that in the oh yeah notes. for sure i don't know it's the english teacher popping out to me you know <laughs> um, you see i haven't heard that story since i was like in the fourth or fifth grade but it sticks with you see yeah. that's, that's the yeah. beauty of myth it, it it burns itself into your brain uh because that's that's a lot more interesting than just saying don't be prideful, kids. Yeah. You, know, you tell this story about a, a kid who, <laughs> you know, is horribly maimed and dies. And, and for some reason. And then that, everyone remembers. That, everyone remembers. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's a reference to it. Like <laughs> you, instead of uh, just hearing it, you have this uh, full story Show that just tell. concretes it into your yeah, memory. So th- this is um, th- this is the function of, of myth to, mm-hmm. to teach and to. 
to, to communicate these, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Life lessons. To communicate these life lessons. Sure, we'll go with that. Yeah. But the, uh, uh, in, so I guess in Jurassic Park, you, we would have, if, if, um, if Hammond is Icarus, then Malcolm would be Daedalus, mm, right? Yeah, he's the one that he's has... warning them? He, he has the, uh, the ideas, you know, he, he's thought about it, you know, yeah. and, and he knows what could happen, and so he's careful, you know. Visually, in the movie, they really do a good job of, of playing those two characters off each other. If you yeah. look, mm -hmm. Hammond is constantly, he's dressed in an all-white suit, whereas mm -hmm. Malcolm's dressed in all black. A lot of the, the scene, uh, a lot of the scenes are structured with them on opposing sides of a table, or, uh, you know... A, One standing over the other, yeah. or, you know, they're always in different postures. They are juxtaposed uh, very intentionally in the Yes, movies. and uh, <laughs> you can... They're always uh, at odds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I, uh, I don't Until think the end. Until the end. Yeah. That, that is where the book differs from the movie. In the movie, Hammond does kind of come around and, and recognize, oh, I'm an idiot. Uh, but in, in the book, he actually gets a rather tragic end. Uh, they don't do this in the movie, um, but there are these little tiny dinosaurs called Compsognathi, if I'm saying that properly, or Compsognathus. Oh, that's a word. word. It's basically like a tiny <laughs> little version of a velociraptor. They're Aww. like the size of a chicken, but they're... Um, yeah. Chickens. Gross. Uh, well, yeah, imagine little dinosaur chickens that can eat you. They're like piranhas it's gone. with legs. It's ruined. Uh, <sighs> but, um, I don't know. I thought they sounded kind of cute for a minute. I know. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, no. and then, and then that's what chickens. he gets eaten by. He <laughs> is literally overwhelmed by his <laughs> oh. creations because I think he falls down a down a ridge or something and breaks his leg, and they all just kind of swarm all over him and eat him. Yeah, he nice. deserved it. Well, and, and in the book, he's much less of a grandfatherly Santa Claus sort of figure. Because in the movie, he's kind of this, you know, he's this nice guy. He's worried about his grandkids. In the book, he's... Does much he, colder. So he, he does have grandkids in the book then. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The kids are in, in the book as well. Interestingly, they change the the genders. In the book, the older one is the boy and the younger one is the girl. Is his name Timmy and his he? I, I think they kept the names. I, I don't <laughs> know. <Worthless. laughs> but in the in the movie, you know, they, they have the girl be older. Mm -hmm. And so they got to kind of have the the uh, the whole thing with Grant. Yeah. learning to love children or at least not yeah. hate them and she kind of has lexi has this funny crush on him which is gotcha kind of entertaining well i tell you what the more i watch jurassic park the more i can't stand timmy <laughs> <laughs> he's yeah. just the roadblock he really? is <laughs> he is the conflict he's he causes the conflict <laughs> Don't and, be the uh, problem. Be the solution. Timmy. <laughs> oh, I want to be the problem. Yeah. <laughs> I volunteer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's like you do, you already have enough tension built up with these giant monsters that are eating people. You don't need a, a dumb kid to not be able to lock a door. <laughs> <laughs> or do you know, jump. Oh, well, I don't want to. <laughs> Well, you're about to die. <laughs> but you do get that really satisfying moment where he gets fried on the fence. <laughs> I know. I mean, it's probably... <laughs> It is. It might be the only time in a movie theater where I, I've I've watched a child get zapped and and been happy about it. <laughs> I know. I feel slightly bad about it, but then I think, why do I feel bad? <laughs> well, and it just looks so funny the way that they, they That's shot true. that. With, yeah. With, like, yeah. Just shooting straight back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good. Oh man. Oh, that took a turn. <clears throat> yeah. It, Sorry. It, it did. Well, we talked a lot about Hammond and Malcolm. Um, what about Grant and Sattler? What do you think about them in this? movie ah. the, the, the two because arguably they're especially grant is more of the main focus and i feel like hammond just brings them along to stroke his ego yeah you know i just like well more you dig hubris. up yeah you dig up dinosaurs i want to show you what i just did i think you <laughs> will really appreciate it you know and it's like here's what you spend your entire life looking for a bone of standing in front of you mm -hmm. all intact moving eating a lawyer <laughs> <laughs> well and you kind of see that was for sure because when he's sitting in the control room and they're on the actual tour and none of the dinosaurs are showing up for show and tell he gets upset and he's sitting there going oh well they haven't seen anything what a ruined tour ah oh, like we have to make sure that tyrannosaurus rex eats that goat oh yeah <laughs> 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 but you really see that where's the goat? reason that they were <laughs> the reason that they were there was for that and yeah well inevitably it becomes that they're there yeah for he was just kind of wanting them to rubber stamp 
his stuff. Yeah, it was it was like, hey, I did this. People respect you in academic circles. Yeah. Can I can I get your stamp of approval? Can I get your endorsement? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's the only reason that he brought them along. That's interesting. One of the other things that this movie uh, book story kind of has working behind it comes from one of the great granddaddies of science fiction, H.G. Wells. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, without H.G. Wells, there there is a lot of uh, well-known science fiction tropes that we just would not have. Things like you know, time travel. Time, well, not we still have time travel, but he made you know he wrote the time machine. He wrote uh, the War of the Worlds. He wrote. Uh, uh, the Island of Dr. Moreau. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, which yeah. is n- probably not one of his more well-known stories now, but it is. it has been adapted into movies before. But the whole idea of that is um, that, a, that a guy is washed up on an island. He's, mm-hmm. he's in a shipwreck or something like that, and, and he, he finds his way to this island where he discovers Dr. Moreau, the disgraced and exiled scientist uh, has has set up shop there and he's been performing all these experiments on animals where he uh, mm. now it's different it, this quote this unquote written, animals well yeah. yeah they start off as animals but he's trying yeah. to the, you, you find out as you read the book that his goal is to try and turn an animal into a human he's been doing all of these experiments oh. cutting them open um called vivisection and and that was a very Mm -hmm. very debated topic in the the period that that wells was writing that there was a lot of of argument because it is a very brutal thing vivisection is is um basically an autopsy done on an animal while it's alive so they're cutting into creatures uh, to try and learn about how they work Mm -hmm. how the how the biology works but you're causing this horrible pain to to the animal well, and that's why Moreau in the book, Moreau was uh, basically banished from the scientific circles and banished from society in Britain, and so he has fled to this island where he has has continued his experiments, and he's actually managed to create these kind of half animal, half human hybrids, uh, which over the course of the book gradually revert back to their animal nature, and that's where a lot of the the tension comes in there because in the book um, quite a few people die, including Dr. Moreau. He ends up getting killed by his, by one of his, by creations. his creations. Yeah. Well, I just watching Jurassic Park, I got a very HG Wells vibe off of it. It just, it reminded me of all of the old movie adaptations of HG Wells novels, like the time machine and um, those sort of films. And it just really kind of, it felt all kind of very, together mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah to Wells me. had this really good way of using uh, the, the technology to you know in his stories to make a point he was imaginative and and he would he would create these sometimes rather <laughs> rather wild ideas about what science could do but he, he always brought the focus back to the humans who were engaging in them like the time machine, it, it, it really isn't about the time machine. It's about the time traveler mm, and yep. the whole human race yeah. as it progresses into the Eloy and the Morlocks. But the it's like a, more of a commentary of what we can expect if we're not careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's I mean really what you see with Doctor Moreau um, yeah. that that he is hoisted by his own petard. He is gored by his own beast man. Uh, and bringing that back to Jurassic Park, that's that's why I, I mean, I understand why they didn't kill um, Attenborough's character in the movie yeah. because he was much more likable. But I yeah. kind of wish that they had. He I think it like, would have been a much more poignant ending. He was yeah. a mix between Grandpa and Santa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's like he's like, oh, Merry Christmas! I brought you dinosaurs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's, he's careful that you, you don't say die. whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> We have different grandpas. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I kind of wish, I think they, they did lose something in the adaptation by, by allowing him to survive. Yeah. Because you, you, you lose the real harsh message of be careful what you do with this technology. That, I mean, really, I would have loved to see Ian Malcolm's reaction to Hammond's death in the movie. Oh, that would mm. be great. That, uh, that would have been... 
what what would have been what could have been yeah uh, malcolm would have probably had some witty oh yeah like one-liner yeah. you know <laughs> yeah but uh, but hey you know you gotta well if uh if like jeff listening. goldblum ever listens to this like <laughs> tell us what you would have said oh right <laughs> maybe <Tweet us. laughs> well and apparently uh he's been cast for the next installment I'm in so the jurassic excited. world franchise so uh may- maybe maybe he'll get to react to uh react to more death i mean they had uh, he, he he did get some good jabs in after Gennaro gets eaten. Yeah, in the yeah in the that's true toilet. But <laughs> <laughs> I still can't get over. I'm running to the bathroom to hide. Uh oh, <gasps> and not just a bathroom, but a bathroom literally with straw walls. Yeah, <laughs> this thing is twenty feet tall, man. Thirty <laughs> feet. Tall, I don't know. <laughs> It's big. It's it's big. <laughs> it's very big. Yeah, it's like the least fortified structure <laughs> right? in the entire park. But hey, hey he's a, he's just the the, the blood sucking lawyer. Yeah, who gets his blood sucked, I guess. Yeah, and swallowed and, and swa- chewed and up and just spit out. And, uh, anyway, man. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, another short story that comes to mind is a sound of thunder. Uh, by Ray Bradbury. Yeah. Bradbury. Another grandfather of science fiction. Grandfather that's not super old. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I'm talking in terms of influence. Influence, yeah, exactly. Um, and A Sound of Thunder, uh, if you're not uh, familiar with the story, is basically a man goes to a time safari to go hunt dinosaurs. He's hunted everything that's living on Earth now, so he wants to go hop into a time machine and hunt a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And, uh, so yeah, if you're thinking that Doctor Who stole that idea, you are correct. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, he goes back in time, and uh, this is uh, a literal butterfly effect because he steps off the path then steps on a butterfly and changes uh, the future just by that one little... Dead insect. Dead insect. <laughs> and uh, Wait, Is this where we actually get the term, the butterfly effect? I'm not sure if that's where it comes from or if it came before and he just literally made it a butterfly. Ah. But it is in the uh, in the book, you know, a butterfly flaps its wings and a hurricane happens and I don't know. Not talk about like, you know, how one little change can influence weather systems or anything like that. Yeah. Um, an imbalance in the predator to... Uh, like, you know, predator-prey ratio and uh, it's something that we've seen here in Idaho, you know, if you have too few wolves, the um, elk are going to run rampant and uh, or if you have too many, there's not going to be any elk. You know, we have to have a balance. And it also goes along with, you know, reintroducing, like we were talking earlier, the dodo yeah. or reintroducing dinosaurs. What's that have? Uh, what effect does that have on the ecosystem? What effect does it have on the surrounding areas and uh that story you know paints a pretty clear picture that just one little action can you know be compounded into major event in the future um especially you know if it's not supposed to happen <laughs> did, did you ever see the uh the simpsons treehouse of horror episode where homer goes in the closet and time travels no, I think it's I think it's a closet. Maybe it's the basement. I love, but it. yeah, it's the tree. It's one of the tree house horror, horror things where he he goes back in time and and he keeps changing things and coming back to the future and he, he keeps he keeps trying to fix it. He he keeps going back in time to try and undo what he did and he just keeps making it worse. And it's it's the Simpsons, so it's hilarious. I mean, how oh, yeah. how he goes and 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 you know Marge and and Maggie have like lizard tongues or or, or the best one is when he comes back and and. Everything is perfect. Everything is like the kids are well behaved. They're rich. <laughs> they're living in. I think they're living in this really nice house. Um, and, and Homer's like, yes, finally. I, I. All right, now I can rest. Marge, can I have a donut, please? And Marge says, what, What's a donut, Homer? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and he runs back into the closet. And then actually, it starts raining outside, and it's raining donuts. So, but oh. he's already gone back in time to fix it. Great. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's uh, really taking yeah, that idea similar. of the butterfly effect and and playing it up for laughs because it's oh, the same yeah. Sense. yeah. But but did we? I mean, you kind of described the butterfly effect. What is the butterfly effect more explicitly though? Okay, so yeah, it's uh, basically uh, changing one little thing in the past could have huge implications and changes in the future. So in the story, A Sound of Thunder, you have. Uh, 
a man who steps off the path. It's a, it's a levitating path, so you don't interrupt the ecosystem at all. And you're only shooting a T-Rex that's going to be dying in 30 seconds anyway. So there's no big change. Uh, they have to bring really high-powered high power, high magnets to get the steel bullets out of the, uh, the T-Rex and bring them back with them. So nothing is left. Nothing has changed. Um, well, anyway, Eccles is the character's name. He goes back to shoot this T-Rex, um, gets scared because it's so big, freaks out, steps off the path, steps on a butterfly. So they, they pull the, the bullets. Travis, who is the safari uh, guide, the guide, um, is mad. And he says, I swear, if anything's changed, you're dead. You know, so they go back into the time machine. They come back to time safari. You notice that everything's a little bit... Everything's the same, but slightly different. And at the beginning of the story, you hear about how democracy has won. This new president is uh, elected, and he's a great guy. But they go back, and everything's spelled slightly different. And then you find out that they are living in a dictatorship. Hmm. And Travis <laughs> is pissed. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then, of course, you they have the, uh, the imagery of Travis raised the barrel of the gun towards Eccles, and the last thing that he heard was a sound of thunder, which is how they described the dinosaur in the first place, was a sound of thunder. And you can really see the parallels between Jurassic Park and that in the sense of um, the <laughs> path. Like, you know, they were they were in these cars that were on the track, and they weren't supposed to really get out of them. And, you know, they're, I told you we should have put locks on them. And they, um, you can see the path from there, and Ray Bradbury's story, and it's also kind of like yeah. one of the reasons because they left the Jeep was one of the things that could have possibly made everything go down the way it did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, I mean, if I remember right, Malcolm is telling them not to do it. They're saying, you know, you should stay in the... Stay in the Jeep. Do mm -hmm. not That's Malcolm, right? go off the trail. Because um, he's the guy that is constantly talking about uh, chaos theory. That's his, that's his specialty. But it, it, that's his area of expertise is chaos and how uh, there are systems that are fundamentally unpredictable. Yeah. That no matter what you can do, there are going to be elements of chance that you can't account for. And then and that's, that's what happens with, uh, with the park, you know, that they, they had all of these best laid plans that ultimately didn't account for the... Uh, for the amphibian DNA that they added to their dinosaurs, changing mm -hmm. things on them so that the dinosaurs exactly. could reproduce. They thought they had worked it out so that they could control these creatures and, and control how often they reproduced uh, by just making them all female. But then they didn't, didn't plan on the added, uh, added DNA, giving some of them the ability to change their gender yeah. for the purpose of reproduction. Life finds a way. And I was going to mention this again because there is. there is a scene in the helicopter. Oh, man. I can remember. Grant. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Grant. Grant is trying to buckle a seatbelt. And it's two of the same. Uh, they're, two, they're both female. Both female buckles, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's no male part of the buckle to tie. So anyway, he figures it out. He ties them together and makes it work. Life yeah. finds a way. So the I always foreshadowing. I always thought that was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, this this movie is, does a great job of foreshadowing, oh, yeah. especially with Malcolm too. Mm -hmm. So, and in that is something else that they kind of altered the books. It's much more complicated. They have this system in the books where the animals, the the dinosaurs, don't generate a particular protein. That they have to get this protein lysine. Yeah. You, they have to get it from their food. Um, so like that, that's their control mechanism, basically that if the animals were to stop being, if, if they didn't get their food from the scientists, then they would die because they would run out of this lysine protein and you know, their bodies would cease to function. But what ends up happening is that they managed to find these crops, which are rich in lysine. <laughs> Of course. Naturally on the island. <laughs> um, and, and so they managed to find another source of, uh, uh, of this thing and, and provide for themselves. So Life finds a way. Yeah. And I think they did have the gender restriction as well in the books. But hmm. I understand making it simpler for the movie. Yeah. I mean, you've only got two hours, two hours and seven minutes. So. Who, who cares about 
proteins. <laughs> anyway, like that. you know, they, they could have done the same thing as The Hobbit and just turn it into. Uh... No, no, we'll get to that some other day. Maybe strong but, feelings. Uh, th- I think Jurassic Park did a good job of straddling that line between sciencey monologues and kind of keeping things simple. Yeah, they, definitely. I mean, they, they hit you with the science, but it's it's not overwhelming for the person who doesn't really care about it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, um, do you think that anything different could have been done to like kind of prevent the whole disaster? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Can what, I say my you, first yes. thing? Yeah, you. Fire no. Dennis Nedry. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I would say something a little bit different. But it, mine also has something to do with him. I did not like him. What, I'm happy Fire he died. Newman from Seinfeld? <laughs> 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 that guy is never going to outlive that role, is he? <laughs> Wayne Knight. He has a name. His name is Wayne Knight. Oh, right. Well, I was just thinking, you know. Hashtag he's... Wayne Knight exists, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's uh, that's one of the you things would, that I was thinking fired of. Him. I would have done something different. Yeah. I mean, ugh, it just. Because that... what does he do in the movie? Okay, well, doesn't he steal all of, like, the dinosaur embryos and then he's going to go and sell them to somebody to make a lot of money because he's not making enough at his job. Right. And, uh, well, in the end, the embryos end up getting buried in a barbersol can (laughs) in a bunch of mud during a hurricane while he's being eaten by a dinosaur in a Jeep. (laughs) And he actually contributes to the downfall of the island. Oh yeah. oh, yeah, for sure, because he mean, turns everything off he turns so everything he can off. get away with stealing all the dinosaur embryos. And then the hurricane hits, mm-hmm. so things really go... Really takes pop. everything offline, yeah. So, so you know, conflict, hadn't... just put in all the conflict. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is a nice, uh, ni- nice underlining uh, of the unexpected again. Yeah. It's a comedy of errors. Oh. I was trying to avoid that word. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, just be- cue the Benny Hill music in yeah. the background. <laughs> oh, I want to see that with with at least one person waving Samuel L. Jackson's uh, severed arm. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so no, no, no. So hear me out. If the hurricane hadn't hit, then they would have been fine. Yeah. And if Nedry hadn't done what he had done, then they would have been fine. Mm-hmm. It's the two together that would cause the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't control the hurricane. But mm-hmm. you could control Nedry. And here's my problem. Hammond is constantly saying, we really spared no expense, we spared no expense, we spared no expense. No expense. Absolutely spectacular design. Spared no expense. Uh, Top of the line. Spared no expense. That's demonstrably false. Spared no expense. Because if you had spared no expense, then you would have paid Nedry what he wanted so that he wouldn't have been so disgruntled so that he wouldn't have done this whole thing with the Barbasol can in the first place. It could have been the greed. He could have gotten exactly what he asked for and been like, I have the opportunity to make even more yeah, okay, touche. You're right. That would have actually that, that and that would have been better too, because then Nedry would have mimicked uh, uh, mimicked Hammond even more. Yeah, it would have been more of the the hubri. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, but still, it, it it makes it makes Hammond's l- constant line. Every time he says that, I I just roll my eyes. Like, nah, you didn't though. You didn't because that guy. <laughs> that guy is doing what he's doing because you're apparently being a cheapskate. Yeah. yeah. That and I really just didn't like his character as a whole. I mean, he was the character that you were, one yeah. of the characters you were supposed to hate, and that when he died, you were like, oh, well, he had it That's coming. True. Who do you hate more, um, Nedry or, or Gennaro? <sighs> Nedry. Nedry. I think you're right. Yeah, I agree. But it still was nice to see the that. lawyer die in the yeah. bathroom. <laughs> well, just to see him get the spit in his face. And oh, that was Yeah. That yeah. when I saw that, I was like, ugh, ugh, <laughs> ugh, because we I had agree. just been talking about it, uh, the venom or whatever that they spit in your face, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, which I know what they're talking about. I think that's one of the things with the the depiction of the dinosaurs in this movie, which is actually not correct. Am I right in that? Do you, I have, I I have no idea. <laughs> I'm trying to remember because there are a few things. Th- this movie was hugely influential, and this might be getting us ahead prematurely but um with how the dinosaurs are depicted a lot of people think of dinosaurs in the way that jurassic park showed them with the with the tyrannosaurus rex having bad eyesight yeah and with the velociraptors and well all of the different dinosaurs looking like salamanders with their skin even though now it looks like 
we have a lot of good reasons to think that dinosaurs may have sometimes or even often had feathers or, or things like feathers. Yeah. But you don't really see that in Jurassic Park. Not in Jurassic Park. Um, I think you do a little bit in Jurassic World. Yeah, they did. They, they um, do it. They updated it. They, yeah, they updated it. Um, and then the fact that the T-Rex had incredible eyesight yeah, in real life, you know. Makes for a great scene, granted. Oh, great, I mean, yeah. that... That scene where the T Rex don't move, <laughs> right? Yeah, oh, all yeah. with the flare. You get the heroic moment from Grant, and, the, and then the dumb moment from Malcolm. The uh, well, yeah, yeah. He's he's a mathematician apparently. <laughs> not, not, I don't even not, know not a hero. Him. Not a hero. <laughs> <laughs> mathematician. No love for mathematicians. The Story Cauldron loves all mathematicians. Yes. Yes. But the uh, no, I'm thinking of when the T Rex busts through the window. Oh yeah, and scares all it scares the kids and stuff like that whole scene. Oh, I just love that. It's so good, and and you mm-hmm. need the you need kind of the conceit of the bad vision to make it work. Yeah, or else it's just gonna be like, well, they all died. <laughs> yeah, I mean, can you imagine going up to, against a, a a realistic T Rex then Ooh. if they could actually see you? Uh, you'd you'd I, basically I be work. out of luck. You would need the Velociraptors to save you every time. Although, granted, that is kind of what ends up happening anyway. Yeah, so it's uh just an interesting thought you know just there are liberties taken there are uh, a few things changed up and you always have that i mean some things are going to translate better in a novel than it, they do in a movie and uh sometimes i'm happy for it sometimes it, it sucks but you know it's <laughs> it's just what happens and i think it works here oh mm-hmm. yeah me too i i think it's great um uh, it, it helps move the story along. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. if you go to any movie thinking that you're going to be able to pass a biology test afterwards, you're probably in for a sore surprise. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is, uh, I mean, you, like, like we were talking about earlier, the, the, these kinds of stories do a good job for explaining general liberal arts sorts of lessons, but the, the ones that communicate actual didactic information like about proteins and and cells and things like that those tend to be kind of dry and not something that you would want to go to for a date night exactly yeah so let 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 the movies be entertaining and maybe learn things from them but don't don't expect that they're going to help you pass your tests (laughs) the um i do i do wonder though if if maybe this movie I wonder if this movie could not demonstrate some of the fear that people do have nowadays about different technological advancements. Um, not not so much in the realm of like cell phones or computers or the internet, but when it does come to things like GMOs, you mentioned that earlier, yeah. and, and uh, the the nervousness that people have about um, scientists mucking around with the wheat genome or the apple or the the fish or or what have you. You know, there's been a lot of pushback lately. People wanting it to be labeled so that they can avoid it if they want to. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, do you think that, I mean, obviously nobody is afraid that an apple is going to eat them in the middle of the night. You never know. <laughs> that, yeah. But maybe that kind of concern about playing God, I think, I mean, you hear that yeah. in the debates yeah, about GMOs. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, well, the way I kind of look at it is no matter what you do to something, if you're changing it, you're changing it. It's not going to go back to being the same thing that it was. So yeah, like, you. There's a chance that you lose the original if you, you know, play around with it too much, and uh, that original may have had a set role in the ecosystem, in you know, or in the world that you're you're kind of messing with stuff. It's it's the butterfly effect all over again, you know. So um, GMO critics can, are um, Ian Malcolm? <laughs> yeah, I think so. In all of his shirtless uh, glory? <laughs> <laughs> Laid back. <laughs> bloody leg. Um, but, oh, you know, I think, I mean, it's, I mean I'm not going to lie. GMOs have done great things for yeah, the world. Sure. They've fed thousands, if not millions of people um, that would have otherwise starved. But it's it's getting to be like, well, we want to make this apple taste like a watermelon. You know? <laughs> and that's you're okay. going a little bit it's, too far, yeah. I feel like. But and it is hard to control. That's one of the criticisms that's been brought against some of this um, 
some of this uh, work is that, you know, if you have, let's say you have a wheat field with a particular brand of, of modified wheat in it, and then across the street is a different farmer's wheat field with a, uh, a heritage grain, which hasn't been modified. The way that the wind moves <laughs> yeah. the, uh, uh, and, and I mean, I'm not a farmer, so I'm, I'm going to use the incorrect words here, but you know, the, the way that the wind transfer, yeah, 4-H guy, help me out here. The way that the wind might blow around. I was going to go with more of a cross-pollination The, the pollen, and, and uh. exactly, that's exactly what you see, cross-pollination problems, where even though a farmer has not planted GMO wheat, they might still get End some of that in their GMO crop wheat. Mm-hmm. And, because it is hard to control things in a wild environment yeah. where you know, unexpected things happen. And, you know, yeah. you can always trace it back to Ian Malkin's line. The scientists, were, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Uh, you always have yeah. to stop and remember, why am I doing this? What mm-hmm. are the implications of doing this? Instead of, let's just do this. Yeah. 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 Cotton candy flavored broccoli? <laughs> yes. <So ready. laughs> yeah. um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what ends up happening with, um, with this. I don't think. Uh, well, I don't well, think we're going to get dinosaurs from GMO wheat. So <laughs> <laughs> on the bright side. Oh, it's like the extreme version of those tiny little pills that you could put in your bathtub and then they would pop up into dinosaur toys. Oh, oh wow. yeah. I remember those. <laughs> but, yeah. but now there, there's a dinosaur in your, in your breakfast cereal. That will bite your finger. That will bite your <laughs> face off <laughs> okay so we've got to wrap this up it's uh we're coming up on time but i think the answer is pretty clear of whether or not we would recommend this movie. yeah I, I mean yes for sure to everybody now i will say my six almost seven year old has not seen this film yet only because i'm pretty sure she would be terrified by it yeah i can That's see true. that uh so may- maybe e- even though it's it's really not gratuitous blood it's really not um, violent. I don't think there's much you know, language, language or anything in it. Although I do remember when I was a kid, this, it, like there's this scene where, uh, oh, it's with the, it's with the, where, where they find the, the sick triceratops. Mm, yeah. Um, I don't know. My, because <laughs> Malcolm, at, at yeah. least, no, <laughs> Sattler, please, please. Well, I'm just thinking of like, <clears throat> that's. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so there there might be some of it that that kids would not be um, one big pile of real stoked for. <laughs> but when yeah. they come of age, oh yeah, yeah when they're not going to be kept up with nightmares because of it, and maybe even when they do. I mean, I, I do think uh, I don't think you should be trying to scare your children, but I, I think um, there can be a, a good a good lesson from that when it sticks in in their in in their brain. But they kind of have to do it on their own. Yeah. So, but, but other than barring that, I think this is a movie for anybody. This is a wonderful film. Anybody and everybody and their dog and great date night. Uh, yes. So no, it's just like Anthony and I have, have said, we've seen this movie dozens of times (laughs) and, uh, it's, it's just because it's a great movie. It's so entertaining. There's so much that it's done for, uh, special effects in oh, Hollywood. Yeah, we didn't even, we didn't talk, even about talk about that. that. But I mean, <sighs> we'll just have the to do partial CGI on. animatronic. Uh, if you've ever been to Universal Studios, go onto the Jurassic Park ride, and it's mm-hmm. it's awesome. You know, um, and the technical effects too. I mean, building some of the that like that that scene with the the dinosaur the, with the T Rex that pushes through the roof. Yeah, that was not in the script. That was a mistake. <laughs> Where that's why the kids are screaming so much because when the plexiglass window falls down on them, it wasn't supposed to do that, uh, but it worked so well that they used that take. <laughs> that's the that's take amazing. That yeah, because it wasn't yeah. just CGI; they actually had you know a robotic um, dinosaur, animatronic dinosaur there. For yeah, that. but th- but uh, on the on the note of special effects, this movie is uh, directly responsible for motivating George Lucas. And Peter Jackson to end up moving towards, uh, in one sense, the Star Wars prequels. So that might be unfortunate. But in another <laughs> sense, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I mean, that, yeah. this, the, like when they saw what could be done with the effects for this film, that's what got them to start thinking, hey, maybe we, maybe we could do something too. That's, uh, yeah, we could do this. That's that's awesome. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I love if you've seen the movie, you know the effects are, are great. They still hold up. They're 
Yeah. They're great. Yeah. Um, especially for being made in, in 93. Uh, yeah. I mean, even, even if it was made what, in, in 2013, 25 years ago, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, bec- I think, and I think that is because they relied on a lot of technical effects, you know, actually building the dinosaurs and stuff. Really. Yeah. I mean, they had a lot of CGI in there as well. Mm-hmm. I think the only effect that really, really doesn't work is that computer program that Lexi uh, uh, tries uh, to use at the uh, end. No, 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 uh, that's great. I love oh. Nedry's little joke. No, the thing that she uses, like the interface for the computer. Where to, she enters the Matrix? Yeah, oh, my gosh. It's so <laughs> bad. It's so yeah. cheesy. What is that? It looks like a... I don't know, but it's, it's like a it's game a, I would have played. It looks like, honestly, 3D Maze. If I remember right, it actually was a flight simulator game. That they just oh like gosh. messed with. It was some kind of game that they used for that because they needed something on the screen. So to show that she could hack the computer. Yes, that she could <laughs> hack because she's she's a hacker. Yeah, but okay. Um, <laughs> if that's the worst criticism you can bring to the movie, it's that's, yeah, it's true. I mean, it's, it's it shows its age in that respect. But oh yeah, oh yeah you had Sattler. What a great great female character. Oh yeah. Uh, there's no romantic storyline really and i mean mm-hmm. malcolm's hitting on her and she keeps like shutting giving him down him the finger yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's yeah it's just there's so much that's going on so much good stuff that is good cool. it's yeah i mean it's just amazing so i have to ask anything that you would change besides the computer program <laughs> well yeah maybe that honestly nothing really comes to mind you know for me the only thing i would change was i would make the lawyer shorts longer because the entire time I kept thinking, wait, is he wearing pants? Like, I know yeah. that was the fashion, but it was like every single time he was sitting down in the helicopter or anything, it was always like you could only see his legs. You could never see his shorts. <laughs> that and is so a, it was like, uh, that is a very specific, is weird. <laughs> very specific thing. No, I think um, uh, having Hammond die, that would be my big thing. I oh, think, yeah. I think that would that would have that would have made a much uh, that would have been the cherry on top. Ending. And yeah, just have him die and then have that beautiful John Williams soundtrack come back in and. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> as he's falling in slow motion. Well, maybe, maybe like cut it, cut it down to a minor key or something. Oh, that'd be beautiful. Ooh. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, I, I enjoy this movie so much that I can't really think of anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I really liked the casting. Mm-hmm. Um, the casting was great, and uh, the fact that they made Jurassic World. And there's so many throwbacks to the original. I I, I actually I, did tear up in that. I movie. like that. So, when, in Jurassic World, when the when the brothers come across the old yeah the old uh, visitor center visitor type center thing. yeah from the first one when when you realize that that's where they are I got I could, I did get a little a little choked <laughs> up a little bit. But Clint. Yeah, it was <laughs> just because that was so um, that was such a surprise. You know, yeah. Like I, they, they did such a good job of not ruining that mm-hmm. in trailers or anything. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and so. the T-Rex is the same T-Rex in Jurassic World from Jurassic Park. Really? It's, yeah, it's the same. Because there's, in Jurassic Park, you know, at the end, the, the Velociraptors come and attack attack her. And she is, um, you know, she like gets bitten on her back. And if you look in Jurassic World. There's like scars. There's scars. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. During that really bizarre scene where Bryce Dallas Howard is running in those gigantic heels. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can, you can, you can see the, that, that it's the same T-Rex that, that saves them. Yeah. Jurassic World was just big hit in the face with nostalgia. Yeah. I was, I was worried that it was going to be another Jurassic Park three. But uh, no, it was pleasantly. Surprised. It was a nice, uh, a nice homage to this mm-hmm. one, and uh, pushing it forward into something new. You know, I think we're just about done. Uh, yeah, if you guys like what we're doing, uh, subscribe to our channel uh, and join us every week for a new movie. And don't forget to follow us on social media. Yeah, the Story Cauldron on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Awesome. And uh, if you guys have any suggestions or if there's anything that you'd like to hear, uh, don't be afraid to hit us up on that social media and we'll see if we can get to it. Um, As always, it's fun to hear you. I'm Bobby. I'm Anthony. And I'm Garrett. And always remember, don't be like Timmy. (laughs) Be useful. (laughs) All right. Thanks, you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.